Hello and welcome to the tenth episode of Random Musings. Uh, we took a break. We uh, took a break for like two, three weeks, I think, uh, mainly because uh, travel has uh, resumed. Uh, life is slowly returning towards normalcy. Uh, I travelled outside Bombay, and my next guest was also travelling. So, uh, yeah, and we'll try and be uh, as as punctual and uh, frequent as we uh, intend to be every Wednesday, but. Uh, will also have these breaks going forward i feel so i'm not promising uh, an episode every week we'll try our best my next guest today is one of the most awaited guests on uh, random musings uh, not just one of the uh, best comedians in the country not just uh, one of the pioneers so to speak in indian comedy but also one of my very very good friends this is an episode i have been most excited about give it up for uh, rohan joshi hello 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 hi kv what's going on Look at both of us sitting here in shorts. Yes, this is so cool. I also have to say it's just nice to be here on a Zoom call with you and not worry about whether I'm going to know the answers to the questions or not. This is a huge relief. This is great. Yeah, yeah. In fact, in fact, we are sure you know all the answers. <laughs> like, Thank God for that. How are you, man? Random musings, as we as we know, Rohan is about conversation that we uh, we haven't had for some reason, mm-hmm. and uh, that's why you want to straight. straight start with something that i wasn't aware of despite being a good friend of yours i believe is that your first job mhm your first job was actually programming music for hotel lobbies and restaurants i mean i i honestly didn't know that was a job job i always thought they just used stock music or some sort of a music i didn't know that was a job either until i got this job i i didn't like like everybody else who thought who would ever think walking into a hotel lobby or a restaurant um or any of those things that there is a per- well at least there used to be i don't know if that's still a thing anymore but there used to be a person that sat there picking tracks for you and for your listening pleasure so if you were going to a restaurant like peshawari or dampok um please know if this was somewhere between february and june of 2003 if you ever went to any one of these restaurants at the itc or whatever um and you heard that music you know that these restaurants have that very typical music right where it said there's this guy who has one sitar and that one sitar has one string and like he like every 4 minutes will pluck one um you should know that there was a guy that picked those sitar songs for you and put them in order to make sure that your dining experience was a pleasurable one wow but yeah. how did that happen ron like 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 how how did you end up like did you want to do like what, what were the circumstances that it's led- a, i'll tell you the circumstances the yeah. circumstances were that in september october of 2002 i dropped out of engineering um and like as as you can imagine i mean everybody knows that i have done engineering and dropped out but as you can imagine um the context to this is that if you can imagine what it is like for an indian student who has been a straight a student to suddenly come home and tell his parents that he is dropping out of college you can imagine what the atmosphere at home must have been like it was a bit of a war zone for a couple of months after i dropped out and i felt like i had to do like this thing where i had to prove to my parents that i left this because genuinely my heart was not in it not because like i'm just some lazy fuck who doesn't like want to do any work so i started looking around for a job and that time uh, i think radio midday or it was called go 92.5 fm There was this uh, radio jockey on it called Anish Trivedi, and I really liked his show. And he used to have a column in the midday, and at the end of the column, his email address was mentioned. And I was like, you know, it'd be great if I could just work on this show. Like, I'll get to listen to cool music. I'll get to do all of these things. It sounds like a really fun job. And I just cold emailed him out of the blue, and I said, Hey, this is my vibe. Um, I don't start college for another six to eight months. I need a job. I'm looking for a job. This is what I want to do. And he emailed me back saying. I can't give you a job at the radio station because I am only here in a hosting capacity. But I have a radio production house where we do a bunch of back-end radio production work. And if that's something that interests you, uh, please come. And I went, and it just seemed like a really sort of fun team, and it seemed like something that would be fun to do for a few months. So I went and joined this radio production house, and I went down this rabbit hole that I never knew existed. I programmed. Uh, So if you went to a restaurant in the ITC hotels at some point between February and June 2003 you probably heard something that I helped stitch together with the help of a very rudimentary version of the algorithm um if you were on Air India at any point uh between February and June 2003 and you tuned into any of the audio channels that you get on the side of your seat 
I probably had a little something to do with that also. Do you remember World Space Satellite Radio? If you listen to one of two channels, one of which was called Lejhum Express and the other one which was called Farishte, one for current Hindi music and one for old and retro Hindi music, I had a little bit to do with that also for six months. Um, and this is before the invention of algorithms and AI and all of that. So we had this huge stack of CDs and one of my jobs as the intern was at that point, we had just gotten, it was revolutionary in 2003, okay? A software that could create a playlist for you out of the songs that you had in your system. Except you had to manually burn each CD into the system and tell it what the song tempo was, what the song pace was, all of that. So that later on its algorithm could stitch it together. So for a few months, I sat there digitizing our entire library and trying to tell this machine. And I, when I say our entire library means I listen to everything from, imagine every Raj Kapoor song to every, like I, I remember there was this one day where I went from Shri Charso Beast to Boys Are Best Jan Lo. Like, because the CDs just happened to be next to each other to like some weird, like afternoon chill driving jazz CD. Um, and the job was a trip. It was, it was great fun. It was six of the most entertaining months of my life. So 2003, all this is happening, Rohan. Cut to 2018, okay? Yeah. It's the year when uh, you're part of AIB, mm -hmm. which, uh, which of course, I mean, I, again, people say, I keep saying this in random using that. That's a topic for another podcast. But I'll say, <laughs> that, I'll say that again, that the legacy of AIB and everything, that of course is a topic for another podcast. But in 2018, you're part, one of the four uh, people at AIB. You're, of course, the flag bearers of Indian comedy, so to speak. And everything is going good. Everything is great. And then uh, there's no more AIB, mm -hmm. right? Uh, when the year 2018 ends, uh, all four of you have your own solo career. AIB is not a thing anymore. Um, the writers are looking for different jobs. It's not mm -hmm. a collective anymore. And then I can only imagine how your life would have turned as an artist in those few months. So, and we haven't spoken about it enough. Mm -hmm. And I'm very, very, very eager to know uh, from you as to the entire phase as to right. when AIB, I don't know if dismantled is the right word, but it yeah, ended. We can, we can go with that word. We can go with dismantle. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then your solo phase begins. You, uh -huh. I, I, I imagine you, you looked inward as an artist as to what is life post AIB, what is Rohan Joshi as an individual um, with, with um, only AIB mm -hmm. legacy and not like your phone number in my, in my phone, still Rohan Joshi AIB. So there That's is great. I hope it is always Rohan Joshi AIB. I feel, yeah. I feel like one of the hallmarks of a great friendship is if you can look back at a number 20 years later and be like, this is still saved as Pintu College. So. Yeah. It, it, that, that's a hallmark of a good friendship. Yeah. So I, I want you to take me and the viewers through this phase of okay. AIB, post AIB and how life has been over the last two and a half years. The the sort of post AIB life in a way started while AIB was still on uh, because the way sort of AIB happened also is um, everybody forgets that the four of us didn't set out to create the AIB that everybody knows and remembers. Uh, this very much started off with two guys with a podcast to four guys who were just really enjoying doing live shows together to YouTube, Twitter, and every single one of those was as much of a surprise to us as it was to the audience. Um, the One of the other problems was that this cycle of work because, oh, the, li the, the live shows did well, so people were like, come to YouTube, and then the YouTube starts doing well, so let's do more YouTube, but let's also do live, and then let's also do branded. Uh, there was this point around 2017 where I was I was exhausted like exhausted in a way that I don't think I'd ever been in my entire life. And I say this as somebody who has like prepped for trying to get like high 90s marks in 10 standard, 12 standard, every single thing. And I still feel like there is no point in my life that I worked as hard as I worked between 2012 and I think 2017, 2018. And I was exhausted and I was running on fumes. Um, so I was sort of already ready to collapse. Then, as you mentioned, AIB is dismantled. Um, and first there's shell shock because it, it, it literally was almost overnight. Um, so it's, it's almost like the event happens and, and my brain is still rushing to catch up with it because that's how fast it happened. So there was this brief period of shell shock where it's like, until yesterday I was doing this one thing and now I see no clear road forward, uh, in the short term at least. So I was kind of knocked on my ass for a bit. Uh, but I spent that time just doing other things. And then I realized that eventually if I wanted to get back and do this, I'd have to do the one thing that has 
in the end always come back and save my career which is that i would just have to write like i would just have to figure my shit out and i would just have to write so i started writing somewhere around december 2018 january 2018 2019 is when i started to write and really really started to write and that's when sort of i got a call asking if i wanted to do a special um and at this point and this is as good a time as any to confess this i had maybe at this point 15 minutes of jokes that i would have been confident putting in a special and i said but i said you know what okay i said okay i i'd like to do a special and they said do you have a date in mind so that way we have a date to work towards so i don't know in what overconfidence when i bol diya september 2019 Like I don't know what overconfidence made me say that, except now we'd committed to this date, um, and now we had to work backwards from there, and it that that actually ended up working out because now that I knew I had a sort of pressure clock to work against, and that's when I started writing, and that's when the writing just became more and more and more. Around February, I started to hit the stage regularly, and then sort of writing, rewriting, writing, rewriting, and then all of that, the sort of solo phase was just relearning. in a sense how to be on stage on my own one of the thing that happens when you work in a collective and when you're on stage with three or four other people i'm sure this is something that happens you probably notice the difference because you perform solo and you perform with rahul right when you're performing as a collective or when there's two of you there's a certain security in having another person on stage with you right where you have that feeling of agar aaj matlab mera mood off hai to aur teen log hai jo pakad lenge right that feeling is always there versus when you're on stage alone where um to sort of bastard as the quote that Tony Stark told Loki in the first Avengers movie but in the end when they're coming it's all on you um it's all on you and that was terrifying to real quite felt like it's been about 5 years since i'd done that in any meaningful way so a lot of that first half of 2019 was just learning to be comfortable by myself and failing on stage again and then the second half of 2019 I remember it just being a lot of flights. I remember the entire second half of 2019 just being a lot of flights. I remember one weekend where I tried to make it from I did in one weekend I did Delhi Chandigarh Manipal which I think is the single most absurd itinerary that any human being can choose in this country. Um mm-hmm. and it was just a lot of that but it saved me. It really legitimately saved me and saved my life in the sense that um I Okay, how do I phrase this without it sounding weird? When things aren't going great for me, I'm not somebody who should be left alone with their thoughts because I am intensely capable of like spiraling and overthinking and doing all of those things. But the writing, the job, the tour, the shows, the knowing that I had to be sharp and on the ball um because the to touch wood it sold really well and that's when i started to because it happens right you you put a show up there like 20 tickets you know right 20 people will buy it and then suddenly you come back an hour later and 20 tickets are sold and you're like holy crap can i can i turn this into 40 tickets and then you're like oh now we have three shows happening in this city and the pressure sort of keeps mounting and when that's happening and i'm constantly looking forward i don't have time to wallow and not having time to wallow especially in the aftermath of aib was hugely important because i feel like i could have spiraled really hard if i hadn't had the work and so that wake and bake tour like saved my life it was great and um yeah so that was all of 2019 so it's a very long winded answer but oh, no. the 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 short the, the the tldr version of it is uh, first two months after collapse of ib very difficult but then work saved my life now that we are talking about it i wanted to mention something a story again that i have never mentioned to you Uh, it, first of all, it reminds me of this B J Nova tweet I recently read, uh, which said that if you want two men to have heart-to-heart conversation, uh, just put a mic and tell them we are shooting a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. It just happens. I was I was uh, recently talking with someone uh, who was talking about uh, this part of uh, it, part of your life because you are involved in this incident. Is when a lot of things are happening at AIB and you're still. writing for on air with ai b because mm-hmm. you have a shoot coming up mm-hmm. and then uh, uh, this is for our for our viewers to imagine so there's a writing room which is led by rohan joshi and there are writers who are writing and preparing hard for the next taping of on air with ai b and then there is a lot of stuff happening outside the room 
So Rohan is leaving the room, going out, discussing things with people, writing apologies and clarifications and everything, and then coming back. And he's again focusing on the writing and the jokes. And the writers do not know how to react because they are aware of what's happening because there's internet. And they're like, what do I tell to Rohan? Should we ask him to take a break? Or should we just... And you you never, like, in that writing room, you never brought what was happening outside the writing room. I mean, how, how does that work? Like, it genuinely fascinates me as to how were you able to still focus on work and still able to sort of compartmentalize and be so professional about what was coming up um, because you still did not know if that shoot will happen or not. I don't know. I wonder if it was professionalism or shock now looking back. Uh, just cold shock. But I think also what it was is um, I really like my writing rooms to be happy. It's extremely, extremely important to me that like my writing rooms or any writing room that I'm part of, like forget my writing room, any writing room that I'm part of, be a happy place because that's where I feel like the best work happens. It's extremely important. And I've learned this the hard way. I've been in bad writing rooms. I've been in writing rooms where people don't get along. I've been in writing rooms where the atmosphere is terrible. I've been in all of those situations. I've I've seen what that does to the quality of work. So I just reached, and especially with Honor with AIB was, Honor with AIB was my baby in the sense that it's, I've grown up watching news comedy and so I, this is something that I wanted to do forever. So that on air with AIB writing room especially, it was extremely important to me that it be like this beautiful happy place. And and this involved everything from um, regular cookie runs to just like taking breaks and playing PlayStation and doing all of that. But it was extremely important to me that every time I stepped into that room, the focus just be either on, the focus had to be laughter. Always, like it always had to be sort of a room of laughter, whether we were having a dumb conversation or whether we were writing jokes or any of those things. And I don't know, maybe it's part of the doorway effect also, just the fact that when you leave a door and when you come in, uh, things change. But it's just, I think I was, it's also, I guess, what the one thing I had left to cling to that day, right? Like as everything else was sort of getting worse, um, that writer's room was that one little happy spot. And also, uh, honestly, there was also a deadline ka tension. Tha. Because we still had like episodes to send to SNP and things like that. Um, so yeah, for whatever reason, uh, that evening at least, I managed to in the writer's room, keep my shit together. But I don't know how much longer that would have gone on. Interesting that we talked about Onwear with AIB and your fascination with news comedy. Uh, because again, I want to talk about something that most people don't know about. Is that uh, you actually studied journalism in some sense. You I did. That one of the most reputed schools in India, which is ACJ in Chennai, Asian College of Journalism. Yes. Um, and uh, I know for a fact that you believe it was a life-changing experience for you in some ways. So let's go back in time. Let's go to Chennai sure. from Bombay. Let's do it. And uh, <laughs> talk to talk 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 us through that phase in life, like studying journalism and then living in Chennai and the entire postgrad experience. Okay. So I, again, and this is that people already know this through jokes about me and jokes that I've made is my entire life has been spent in one very posh corner of South Bombay Like my entire life. Like until I went to Chennai, I had not lived anywhere else in the world. I had traveled, but I'd never lived anywhere except South Mumbai as a result of which all my experiences of people and everybody I'd met had been a very narrow worldview. I thought that the world looked and felt a certain way and I was very certain that this is what the world is. And then I go to ACJ to study not just journalism. Let me qualify here that in 2007, I decided it would be great to specialize in broadcast journalism. Cause you see, I thought that shit was going to be the future. And um, so I went and studied broadcast journalism. I get to ACJ and also what's happened in South Bombay is growing up. I've been like this nice sort of big fish in a small pond, right? Like small school, great grades. Um, sort of local college in South Bombay with some of great grades. Uh, so I think I'm the shit at this point. And I think I know everything. Then I go to this college where for the first time I am challenged uh, in, and I mean challenged in every single way from the actual difficulty of the coursework to professors treating you like adults and not spoon feeding you to being thrown extremely provocative challenges to what I thought at that time was my ideology and my makeup as a person. ACJ is, it's at least when I was there, I don't know how it is now, but when I was there, it was every day, it was like being thrown 
like a an informational hand grenade i'd call it like every day you'd walk in just recovering from the previous day is this thing and then there'd be and i remember it being everything from one day you'd walk in and there'd be like a 4 hour seminar by an ex armed forces person on india's naval strategy and overall its naval this thing versus suddenly you'd come back two days later to a five day uh series of lectures by p sainath on sort of how to cover and understand the nuances of covering rural issues in india to i remember the day like one of the days that changed my life was when a very very noted bahujan scholar came in like named dr kanchai laya came in and gave a a lecture that i think can given the atmosphere in class after that lecture can in at, at most polite be called divisive and it was it was the first time in my entire educational life where i was in a classroom where i could genuinely sense the energy around me of the people around me polarized because this was essentially a lecture on caste and it was a lecture on brahmanism and it was a lecture on so many things and everyone's sort of ideologies rose to the surface over the course of that day i still remember it as being one of the very few days in college where lunch in the canteen between everybody was eerily silent because it was almost powder keg like and i remember sitting through those lectures and then sitting through some of the conversations that people were having and as a result of my a realizing my enormous privilege uh while sitting in that lecture and b being staggered by the conversations that people were having around me listening to the nuance around them and immediately and this is a weird feeling for someone who's never had it before feeling dumb like just feeling intensely stupidly dumb like this moment of just i don't know anything and it's just this moment where i'm sitting in the canteen and there's all these people having these conversations and then the conversation sort of moves over into the dorm where it's like while drinking everybody's having these conversations and i'm just silent because i realize i have no perspective on this i have no understanding of this i have no education of this and i just suddenly realize i am in chennai and i'm dumb and i don't speak the language and i have a lot of work to do and i remember this moment very clearly i just went to my room and i cried because i was suddenly just so overwhelmed this moment of my whole life has been a lie i thought i was smart i thought i was cool i thought i had worked hard i thought i had gotten things on merit i thought i thought i thought i thought i thought and in a few weeks this slate has just been wiped clean as a result of for the first time in my life meeting new ideas and meeting more and this is why i would 100% say i recommend that every single person if they have the privilege and the opportunity please do a post graduate course in any school where you know you will meet people from a different spectrum from the people who you've grown up with because that year transformed my life it transformed my understanding of what i thought i knew it transformed my sort of understanding of how smart i thought i was i i don't think i've ever since that day since i went to the day i went to acj i have not felt smart i have always felt like a person who has a lot of questions and no answers and i think that is fundamental to who i am even today and yeah that year it it blew my mind it was it was a year of intense just what is the word how do you want to say the word intellectual because that's such a weird word just a year of let me phrase this let me phrase this it was like a year of every morning being woken up the equivalent of having cold water thrown in your face but that cold water is information yeah and the whole year was just that and that information came through lectures that information came through conversations with people who were very kind to explain their lives and their contexts to me that information came through remarks from teachers that information came through just going out and reporting in the streets of chennai and uh, it changed it changed my life forever like I, i spent a maximum of 2 years in journalism after that and that also ended up being soft feature journalism but i feel like there's a tiny piece of that perspective that i still carry today in every joke that i write there's a tiny piece of critical thinking that still i can trace back to my time at acj that attempts at least to inform every joke that i make or every sort of thing that i say on stage the only thing i I'd, i'd like to add uh, in terms of the postgrad suggestion that you gave like if if life gives you 
chance or privilege to go out and study please do that uh, the one thing i'd add is that if again if life allows you please try and live in a city which is far from your homeland if you have like no family reason or like no constraint as such uh, always always try and study or work in in a place in india uh, which is far from your from your native place or from your home city hard agree hard yeah. agree because if, if, uh, for example if you if you if you're someone who grew up in delhi and you have an it job that same it job same company everything is the same and you're getting the gurgaon office and getting a chennai bangalore hyderabad office please go to chennai hyderabad 100% please. 100% it just changes your life completely it com- it completely changed my life like it did it, it, i remember being on an assignment once where i had to go cover something that was happening in the street and just this feeling of helplessness at being like i'm talking to somebody and they're talking to me in tamil as they should be because i'm in chennai mm-hmm. except i as a result of my sort of alienness don't understand a word of what's being said and now i have to take this information back to my studio and get somebody to translate it for me and make sure that i'm not butchering the context that they've given me and once you get a little bit of that perspective uh the fabric of this country just you have significantly more respect for it uh you also uh, go to sleep sometimes at night significantly more terrified for it if that makes any sense uh because you realize that this this the, the fabric of this country and our society is built on so many frail little interconnecting layers contexts connections community but also abuses and oppressions and so many other things it's the sort of thing where sometimes if you lie awake thinking about it at night you'll never go to sleep and um i yeah it 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 completely opens your brain up yeah totally agree especially now that you've talked about it especially if you're say if you're in bombay okay and you grow up here like you said in the cocoon of south bombay for instance yeah and you do work that people read or watch you're writing book you're writing articles you're making movies yeah with no perspective of how this country works oh, because absolutely. it's so easy for you uh, as in not you like for someone to be in bombay and be like hey man why are we talking about caste it, it does not exist no no i'm actually very glad you say that because that was going to be my example right now i was going to say exactly 100% that growing up in south bombay like what is caste i don't see caste caste thodi na hota hai india mein abhi aaj kal there's no caste and then you 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 spend one year away and you're like okay बहुत कास्ट होता है इंडिया में आजकल आई गेस एंड या आई फुल्ली अग्री विद यू अबाउट दिस 100 परसेंट इफ यू हैव एवर बीन इफ यू हैड अ शेल्टर्ड लाइफ यू ओ इट टू योर सेल्फ टू स्पेंड एटलीस्ट अ ईयर और टू सो फार आउटसाइड ऑफ योर कंफर्ट जोन दैट यू हैव नो चॉइस बट टू जस्ट स्टे डाउन द कम्प्लेक्सिटीज ऑफ दिस कंट्री ओके वी टॉक्ट अबाउट गोइंग आउटसाइड योर कम्फर्ट जोन एंड सो आई वुड do the reverse and now i'll take you back to your comfort zone uh, rohan Ooh. and we'll uh, we'll talk about comics now okay okay <laughs> okay yes yes let's talk about comics because i know you're obsessed with comics now i am i am obsessed with comics comic books uh, movies based on comic books uh, shows based on comic books uh, graphic novels uh, uh, you know uh, uh, how do i put it animation based on comic books all of it all of it all, all of, of it. it and uh, so you love comics and uh, i do. i know that you uh, you have a, an issue you have an issue about uh, the way comics are looked as as an art form or not you know i do art. i do have an issue with the way comics are perceived i think what happens is when anything is colored or animated or in a certain way our brain has this thing of switching it down to it's for kids mm-hmm. just because that is the traditional way of looking at say the cartoon or the illustrated image right and i think that does a huge disservice especially to comics because it's these are very this is a broad broad swath of not just pop culture but literature that you're ignoring um when you dismiss comics that way because this is an art form that has now been consistently written and illustrated for for almost 100 years which means there's a 100 years of literature in there and if you're going to dismiss millions of copies of hun- of a 100 years of literature as it's just for kids then you're really 
your what you're doing is you're you're scrubbing some beautiful stories from the archive you're saying that this is not worth recording in a sense and i think that's really sad because i think when you go out and you look at comics on the one hand yes you could argue that you know one of the biggest problems is all this american ex- exceptionalism because of their superheroes etc all of that granted absolutely true but the fact is that most comics have always been for people who felt like outsiders to find something where they found characters like themselves or where they found some form of community or communion because i feel like like take somebody like spiderman for example right it's just a topic like i never get tired of talking about spiderman is he's not superman he's not batman he's not any of those things so to the average kid reading spiderman what makes spiderman work is that this is it's the ultimate anti bullying story in a way it's about a scared little kid that manages to take charge sure they get these superpowers and all of that but the thing that that had again the captain america story also right it's about it's the story about somebody who's been bullied so relentlessly that the second they get power in their hand instead of bullying back they immediately extend a net of compassion to everybody around them and i think that some very beautiful stories have been told like there are there are there are superman stories i could give you there are spiderman arcs i could give you there are so many different comic arcs i could give you from what seem like traditional superheroes um which where if you just sat down with them for a couple of hours and read you'd be weeping like you would after any book that you consider to be like high literature or high art or any of that and and they have this great power to pull you away from pain like i'll give you my simple example right this is me i'd been reading comics my whole life but in 20 in august of 2013 um actually i don't know when you're going to release this but the fun fact is that here we are on the day that we're taping this it's actually my it's my dad's eighth death anniversary today and so this time uh eight years ago uh we very suddenly lost my dad at the age of 63 64 um i still remember i was driving back from an aib meeting when my mom called and said you need to come home and i went home and i remember the next couple of weeks being obviously very difficult and very traumatic and very sad and all of those things but i remember at the time i had on my ipad we will not talk about how they got on my ipad but i had on my ipad uh, this collection of green lantern comics um and it was this particular series called blackest night and it was this sort of run of 2030 comics which involved all the superheroes of the dc universe and a few days sort of after he passed when there was finally a lull or sort of calm in all the formalities and family members going around i just had for the first time in what felt like ages a couple of hours to just sit and be my myself i started reading blackest night since it was there on my ipad i reached in and i started reading blackest night and i remember there was this point where suddenly it's 3 hours later uh and i've been reading and i come across this one character it's actually quite a cool thing so the the way it works in dc with the lanterns is you have the green lanterns and the blue lanterns and the red lanterns and the yellow lanterns and each color represents a different emotion for example so red represents rage so the red lanterns are they're not evil so much as they're perpetually in a state of rage because rage is their dominant emotion and it was there was this one beautiful character in there um there's this character in there that's a cat um and you're like how come this cat is filled with rage and the cat's entire story is that the cat was adopted by this person who was very loving to it but then the cat had to watch that person be murdered one day in a sort of home invasion type this thing and not being able to and not being able to comprehend the senselessness of it it just filled this cat with rage and now the cat just sort of travels through the universe taking its rage out on people and there was in that moment where i was just exhausted and tired and sad and angry and all of those things that image just connected with me so hard that i just started bawling like i just started bawling and bawling and bawling and bawling and bawling and the catharsis was just next level and my point is these these little stories that involve flying men and women doing all sorts of absurd things at the core of them are just beautifully emotional stories and i think people who dismiss them uh out of hand without looking into that or without giving them due credit for that are kind of missing the forest for the trees the part that i relate to the most and which is sort of giving me goosebumps right now is the is the way these things work as a form of healing oh absolutely yeah 
Yeah, because I'll I'll tell you one story now that we are sharing stories that we have the third to one shared stories. I'll tell you one of the saddest nights of my life, Rohan, and you'll know you'll relate to this so much because you know me now so well. Yeah. Okay, one of the saddest nights of my life. Okay. Uh, I am in a drawing room. Okay, a living room with some of my relatives. Okay, and this is legit, legit a horrible night. Like I would not want to go back to that night. Okay. okay. We are having intense discussion. Okay, it's end. of a very significant part of my life is happening that night okay and i am just walking around that room listening to people say things that you would not want to hear so i'm of just walking course. around and i'm like rethinking your whole life and it's it's just a generally a very very sad time and you're just and i'm walking in that living room i go to the corner my phone is getting charged okay and i pick the phone okay and this is in singapore so i was on a vacation so i knew it won't be work Mm-hmm. but whatsapp let me check i open whatsapp okay and this is a group you are a part of okay this is a group right. where we send quiz question right okay so this is legit what happens i'm sad really sad last 3 4 hours worst conversations of my life i walk in the corner there's a notification on the phone i pick the phone up there's a quiz question okay i i i see and i say telangana i remember the answer okay I crack it within a like you know it's an India question. Yeah, 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 of course, I, that's your thing. I, yeah, I'm walking. I take the phone. I'm Telangana. Keep the phone back and again start walking. <laughs> and I feel so good because I've cracked a quiz question. I feel so good, Rohan. Right. I was like, right. Man, in middle of all this, those few seconds of happiness in that night was because fuck, man, quiz question cracked it. You know. It's the power of play, man. I feel like as adults we forget. the power and the healing power of just of playing of cutting loose we dismiss so many things as we grow older as being for children well have you fucking forgotten how happy we were as children i mean things for children are the best like they're the absolute best children are like always happy uh, quizzes books with vivid lurid colors in them games uh sport all of it it's just it heals people it heals people so much Yeah, so let's talk about this throne because I know that you know you love playing. Or mm-hmm. I know uh, you've been obsessed with uh, dun- dragons and dungeons. Yeah, dungeons and, dungeons and dragons. Yeah, dungeons and dragons. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you play video games. PlayStation. You mentioned earlier. You love quizzes. Like I I've, do. I've, you've never said no to a quiz. I know never, that. Never, never, never. So you love doing this. Uh, let's talk about this throne. What do you feel about? Uh, like, let's talk about it in detail. Let's delve further about playing games as an adult. I think adults. So I think adults forget how like the importance of play and what play does. Right, just that idea of expressing yourself in a thrilling but ultimately consequence-free environment. Right, like we're not. I'm. I'm not talking. We're not playing the Premier League. We're not playing any of those things. If you and I hang out today, whether it's a quizzing tournament or today's whether a quiz like you and I participate in, right? For example, um, we. we know that these are ultimately consequence less like it says there's our larger lives are not changed by the existence of this quiz or changed by any of that but just the thrill and the emotions that we experience in the 4 hours of battling out to know those answers or whatever when we do our epic quizzes right it just it takes you on these low stakes but very exciting emotional highs and lows uh that i think we forget about in our day to day basis because I think what happens is, and and this is understandable, right? Like when you when you become an adult, especially today, we are, we are, we are privileged in the sense that we we are well to do. We don't have too many responsibilities in the sense that neither of us has large families to take care of or do any of that. But the average adult life is consistently stressful. There's there's no space in it on a day to day basis for exhilarating victories and devastating losses because you can't have that in a high consequence life of adulthood. which is why i think play is important because i feel like through play you get to experience these daily highs and crashes without any consequences and you still get to feel emotions and you get to as you're feeling those emotions process so many things like today it's as simple as whether i'm playing a sport or just in the middle of a run or something like that sometimes i get my best thinking done in that minute between minute 30 to 60 of like a run or even if it's a game of poker sometimes right with friends like there's there'll be this moment in hour 4 of the game where you're thinking of something else entirely 
and the highs and lows of the game have just triggered something. It's just like, hey, you know that thing we were writing? I think it's fixed um, because of this thing that happened uh, in, in this game. And I think adults just really need to rediscover if they have the privilege to with their time and with their money. If they do, I think adults need to rediscover the concept of play. Wow. Okay, I want to end our conversation with something that you said in the in the end, which is rediscovering things. And uh, I know that uh, you love food, so do I. It's one of I our do. common love. And you rediscovered food in 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 lockdown. And when I say rediscovered, I mean you started cooking, uh, you started experimenting, yeah, you started going and checking out recipes. Your friends started helping you with recipes. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Nice Maharashtrian dishes. Etc. Full on. Uh, Talk to me about it, Ron. Let's let's talk on this. Let's end on, on this happy foodie note. It's it's been a joy again, and to bring things back to um, it's a full circle again. Come back to my dad. Is uh, my dad introduced me to the idea. So my mom is a tremendous cook, and my dad would love sort of taking me out to experience all the food which she didn't like to cook. So as a result of that, um, my parents have always encouraged me. to eat well to try different things to not my my they I've been very fortunate in that they've given me very open perspectives on food I still remember there was this point at which um we were hanging out with some family friends where uh I noticed that them and their children were not eating the same food that we were eating and they weren't eating meat and I tried to ask my dad what it was and he mentioned that it was a religious thing and I asked that like you know so should we be worried and i remember i was like 8 years old and he looked me dead in the eye and he said no religion is for here food is for here there's a line between these spaces never mix them yeah. right 8 years old and it's advice that has stood with me till like today um and as it is i was always encouraged to like experience the joy of food so it's one of those huge regrets and losses in my life that i didn't learn to cook earlier it was just and i will fully own all like the typical like male entitlement this thing here to be like there was always someone cooking for me at home there was always food on my table there was all of those things or like make you see who and then as i grew older also it was like i you know work happened i could hire a cook or i could order food or do any of those things so i basically like privileged my way through life without uh cooking and then in the lockdown i made my first ever like the only things that i could make which is spinach because i read that it takes 3 minutes to wilt spinach and uh, a grilled cheese because hey how hard can it be to melt cheese and i started doing it and then i started working with slightly more complex things and i realized that i really enjoyed a it's, it's at that now it sounds damn lofty and people who have been cooking their whole lives will be like wow abhi tere ko pata chala um but it's at this beautiful intersection of art and science right food at the end of the day it's it's magic basically where the idea is if you take these six diverse things and you apply a certain amount of heat to it coated in a certain amount of fat magic will happen and for me the joy has just been to i it's it's going to sound horrible but i have become my mother in the sense that after i started cooking and like the other day i made chili chicken and i made some sweet and sour chicken and i made this popping bacon fried rice and it was so sad like after my first bite i immediately went like ye hum hotel mein kyu khate ye to main ghar pe bana sakta hu like immediately it happened it happened so seamlessly i can't even tell you where it just happened so seamlessly and i just stopped for a second i went oh fuck <laughs> that was such a quick transition and i just i just genuinely and i think we're very fortunate is that we live in an era where cooking is looked at very scientifically you know partly just because of all the climate problems that are coming and all the agricultural problems that are coming but what i like is that we live in an era where food is being divorced from a lot of its mysticism it's being sort of divorced from a lot of bullshit that surrounded it and um, so i'm also very fortunate that like we happen to have access to books that look at cooking very scientifically there is one book i read called salt fat acid heat which just talks about like all the science that involves the breaking down of food when it cooks and there's this great sort of indian equivalent of that book by uh, this writer called krish ashok who i'm sure if people are on twitter they follow him he's got this book called masala lab which is where he just takes a very sign he's like here's the science of everything that happens in the food that we cook everything from so here's what's actually happening in a pressure cooker to here's what happens when you put masala and salt to here's what wheat is like and here's what rice is like and it just it just feels like like why didn't anybody teach me science like this in school uh, i would have learned a lot more 
so it's just again it's just you know like both of us have this in common i think that uh there's no rabbit hole of information that we won't chase down and i think i think cooking is just this new stream where i feel like this is whole world of information that i have no access to that a lot of people i know like take as self evident truths my friends laugh at me when i have all these moments of revelation where they're like yeah you know if you've been cooking for the last 20 years this would not be as revelatory to you but it's just, it's just been fun it's just been a lot of fun thank you rohan thank you thank you as as expected what a great range of conversations we had um kv it's uh, always a pleasure you know you and me man if we sit to chat it's always fun like i i can't think of a single boring conversation we've had so it's all good yeah that's a, you know i I've, i've been trying to curtail the the topics you know what i mean it just for the interest of time because they're like oh i can also talk about this oh he talked about this let let me get you we'll record them all we'll do a two parter we'll break it into two parts it'll be like dune <laughs> okay uh Rohan, now we are going to rapid fire, which is a very non-controversial. This is just one of those fun, fun questions, like favorite, this, favorite dad, favorite dad. So we'll do that. The only challenge is you can't think. Okay, okay, okay. Like okay. top of the mind, okay. whatever comes. Okay, uh, okay, cool. And cool, then we we'll cool. go back to all the answers and Jeopardy want... rules, basically. Jeopardy yeah. rules. Yeah. <laughs> Once then... you buzz, you gotta just answer. Cool. Yeah, you have to answer, and then we'll go back to the answers. And if you want to elaborate, like a minute or two about every answer that you gave. Okay. Cool. Cool. So this is rapid fire with Rohan Joshi. Your favorite AIB video? Oh, that's easy. Just rain. Uh, how to cricket? Your least favorite AIB video? Ah, uh, there was a video we did called the Such a Nocalypse. That's my least favorite AIB video. One word for the following people: Tanmay Bhat, legend. Ashish Shakya, cracking hard worker. Gur Simran Khamba, genius. Your favorite Indian comedian? My favorite Indian comedian. Oh uh, shit! Um, I'm not allowed to think. You said. Yeah, you. Uh, I'm gonna say okay, okay. I'm gonna say Kanan. Okay. Your favorite Indian comedy special? My favorite Indian comedy special. Again, I just go with Keep It Real. Favorite movie of all time? The Matrix. Favorite TV show of all time? Lost. Favorite music band of all time? Blink One Eight Two. Favorite AIB writer that you work with, apart from the other three? Like, oh yeah! Apart from the other three, favorite AIB writer that I, hey man, don't make me choose like this between writers and all. Yeah, I refuse to answer these questions on grounds of like it's against my religion. Uh, true, but favorite, 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 favorite AIB writer, favorite AIB writer. Itne to the yar, but like um, I think just for sheer like consistent like just on the ballness in terms of how much this thing. Uh, Mr. Devaya Bopana. Favorite book of all time. Favorite book of all time. Holy shit that's so difficult. Yeah. Uh I'm going to go with Ooh um Hound of the Baskervilles. Nice that's it. Woohoo. Ooh, ooh, ooh. let's go back. It's ooh, very ooh. exciting very exciting very exciting to go. because I knew this movie TV show question you'll Yeah yeah. I have different answer tomorrow or like five Yeah yeah of course of course of course of course of course. It's fun to see what comes first. Yeah yeah of course. Your favorite AIB video is something I don't recollect at all. So tell tell me about Great. the Jasrain video. So let me tell you about the Jasrain video. The Jasrain video is called How to Cricket. Uh, please look it up. Uh, so usually whenever people ask me this question, my two answers are How to Cricket and the Alia Bhatt Genius of Your video. And the reason, but the reason How to Cricket is my favorite child is because it is the most absurd stoner thing we have ever put on our channel. Like it's just. it's beautiful it's a it's a work of art like in in its own right and it's the sort of thing that only a certain particular and peculiar kind of stoner can like because i remember this because even when the video came out we knew that it was going to be divisive as best and even today i go through the comments like and it's so beautiful because it's the only video that i can say for sure every alternate comment is like one is like this is the most genius thing that i've seen and the second comment would be like what the fuck is this shit What nonsense have you all made? Then the third comment will be like, only true stoners will like this video. Then the fourth comment will be like, ये लोग क्या पीके बना रहे थे क्या ये वीडियो मतलब क्या है ये? Um, and and it's great. It it it's one of the few videos that I can say. And again, it was made uh in very low pressure. It was this was it because there were no consequences to it. It was just we wanted to shoot something with just rain. We had three to four hours, so we just went into the OML office and we just we had a basic script and then we just fucked around. and the resulting thing it's the most 
I would say improvisational, like interdimensional cable Rick and Morty type sketch we've done in our history. Wow. Wow. Which brings us to your least favorite sketch. Again, a sketch I can't think of. I thought uh, I thought you'd say the reason you can't think of it because it's been destroyed and like it's been, it's all copies of it have been like completely okay. ruined. Which one did you think I'd say? I thought you'll say, you'll go with the badam pista kaju that Diwali. I love badam pista kaju. I, that again is it's, it's, it sits there in like stoner heaven for me. Um, <laughs> that that's exactly the sort of work I would do for the rest of my life. But no, so such an apocalypse was this sketch that we did. And again, it's it's a great example in what happens when you try to write backwards. Uh, it was Sachin was retiring, and we just wanted to do something to celebrate Sachin retiring. So we basically tried to do this sketch where it's like people keep looking for. Uh, so basically, the BCCI has made like sharing videos of Sachin batting illegal or whatever. So people keep trying to buy it like drugs, and then we like really overthought the premise, and then we really like went somewhere else only with it. And then I remember Bijoy Nambia directed it, and it went like it really. It was one of those things where it's like more money than sense, like and that idea is the pinnacle of that. Like what we had thought of was just the simplest one-line sketch of where basically Sachin's batting is like drugs, and people love it. Or fir us idea pe humne itne layers dale ki the main idea only got buried, and um, it just came from this backward ass place where it's like Sachin is retiring, so we need something, yeah. as opposed to genuinely having a good idea for a sketch. Yeah. to do when sachin is retired is just a horrible compromise bloated terrible piece of work you said one word for the for the three uh, huh. self members of the you said tanmay you said legend huh wanna, he's, wanna i think talk? it's very self explanatory right like that he's like like i don't think there's a single place where he's gone he just not immediately carved a niche for himself and not just a niche like immediately made a ton of space for himself and like become like the definitive this thing in that today whether it was writing with him at aib where the guy could spit like 50 ideas a minute to what he does with his streaming uh to he's always thinking three steps ahead he's always thinking next what he's always he's and he's just one of those people who when it comes to audience is naturally magnetic um to audiences where there are times when you watch him on stage and you're just like man this is irritating like it's just it's just, it's just infuriating uh but no he he and 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 i feel like it's one of those things where like i think it's it, it's a name that's going to and i mean legend in the truest sense of the word in the sense that i feel like it it's going to be one of those names that outlives him like by a long long this thing like when sort of history of comedy is written it will be a name that features prominently it's just as sort of simple as that Ashish, you said hard work. The guy's work ethic again. It's one of those things where if you're in a room with somebody and like this is annoying. Like I wish I had this discipline. I wish I was capable. I'm that guy in the project group. See, it's not like I don't work. I work, but I'm that guy who after four to five hours will be like, "To fir, मतलब ice cream खाने चले क्या?" And Ashish will be like, "Nahi." Or छः joke लिखने हैं. Like he's the guy who will have the documented structure. He's the guy who. when you're wandering away to chase butterflies will be like guys come on and aside from that add to that brilliantly sharp joke writer yeah. like in terms of just pure joke writing skill and assembly everybody knows right he has a column which he's written for several years and everybody's seen his words right in his column and all of that when you apply that to joke writing you just have one of the sharpest joke writers in the game yeah. like straight up kamba genius I feel like that was a cop out answer because like it's just the same this thing again uh just I think dedication and sort of focus like because it's just it's like one of those people where again like I've seen him work really really hard like in life so it's just where do you get the energy to do that where do you get the energy to be that consistently focused because I I just it, that's not that's not me I I just sat here telling you for 10 minutes the joy of play um so yeah Your favorite Indian comedian, you pick Kanan Gill. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Fun fact, Rohan. Till date, this is the tenth episode. Literally, everyone has answered Kanan Gill for that question. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised at all. Kanan is great. He's very funny. He's got great presence on stage. Um, he's one of those comics where, again, when you watch, and as, as and you know this, right? As somebody who does comedy, when you watch a lot of comedy, even with some of the greatest comics, once they start their premise, you get a sense of where the joke is going. Uh, what's great fun about watching Kanan's comedy is that he's one of the few comics where um the sentence can start and genuinely somewhere up until like the bottom third of the sentence you have no idea where the sentence is going to go um and and there's something very surprising and delightful about that 
Um, and I just sort of, I, I, I love, I love how he just sort of carries that energy around into everything that he does. Yeah, yeah. And consequently, you also said your favorite Indian comedy special is Keep It Real. It's one of those specials that sort of knows exactly what it is and does it perfectly. Um, this is just a guy on stage telling jokes. There's none of the sort of other trappings we've now come to associate with modern comedy, right? Where I feel like like where somebody like Bo Burnham has almost taken it to another extreme where now it's like unless you have some next level performance or whimsical element to your comedy, it's not that. But like keep it real, it's just like, it's just this beautiful classic special. Um, which is just, it, it's a guy telling jokes for an hour and he just does a damn good job at it. Wow. Okay, now comes the fun part. Okay, and you'll have to justify why these works of art came before. Yeah, okay, I can do that. Okay, let's begin with movies. You picked Matrix over every other movie. Okay, I'm just going to say it. We could have a whole separate podcast about this. <laughs> but, 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 um... Uh, the the matrix was the movie like even today like in my life like comedy comedy was sub ambition hai but in life i want to make science fiction whether it's a movie or a show or whatever and a large part of that is thanks to the matrix which i saw when i was 16 years old and this again i let me paint you a picture it's the it's the 4th of july 1999 let's go back actually it's go it's the 1st of july 1999 uh, the internet is not really a thing other than your basic stuff there's there's no larger awareness of movies other than whatever's coming to the theater nearby i was walking around filling my college applications i had just finished my 10th standard i was dropping college application forms off at multiple colleges and while i was walking from one college to another i passed the music store i passed this music store and i was like you know what it's a new music store let me go in because i've been walking for a lot of hours and it looks like it's me ac so <laughs> i go in and there's some sort of contest going on inside and i'm just here I'm walking in they hand me the card and they ask me to fill in something whatever who is the lead actor in the matrix or something like that or utna ek aisa poster ka star movies pe dekha tha so i was like oh keanu reeves or whatever I, that and i chuck it in 10 minutes later they call my name and they're like hey you have two tickets um to watch this new movie that's coming out next week called the matrix um so go and i still remember the day it was the 4th of july 1999 I'm reasonably certain it was a Sunday morning. Uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, I reached the theater. I had no idea what this movie was. I'd seen one trailer. I had no other context. And then for the next 137 minutes, I just got slapped in the face by this movie again and again and again and again and again. And I didn't know what was happening. And I still remember it's the first movie I can definitively say where credits rolled, lights went up. people started leaving the person i'd come with got up to leave and i was just like i'm going to have to sit here for a few minutes because there's there's no blood in my legs right now like my legs are weak uh, my knees are trembling i cannot stand up i'm not sure what i've just seen i have never felt such strong emotions after watching a film and um this is what i want to be able to make people feel in my life like just thrill people like in a way that's just and then just as the wachowski sort of continued their career um it then became clearer and clearer and clearer just and not just their career but this is important their lives um their lives have also had some extremely interesting changes as they have gone on and then you start to sort of step back and see like what a definitive work it is right like all the way back in 1999 um it's easy to read it as a sort of just anti capitalist story right where it's it's this guy and there's all these structures and the structures are not letting him be who he is and when he becomes neo he finally is who he is and then you cut to it's it's 20 years later and we're in 2019 and then when 2020 2021 where um you suddenly see the metaphors around gender and you see the metaphors around like given that um both the wachowskis have since the movie came out transition um you know you suddenly start to see the larger metaphors in the film and you see that in 1999 they were telling a story about a conversation that we weren't even ready to begin to have um and there it is 20 years later and it's still very much that anti capitalist satire and it's still all of those things but underneath it is just this magnificent just story about being true to yourself and this is welcome to my new podcast called the wachowski is a critical appreciation um 
where this is a story that they have carried throughout their career this is true of their previous film the first film which was called bound which was literally about um two women who can't have a relationship because one of them is already in another relationship with a guy um moving on all the way to even something like speed racer which people pan which even with all of its like hyper this thing colors and based on children's cartoon and all of that stuff is still fundamentally the story about a person who learns that the game is rigged and has to be played a certain way but then stands up and says you know what no i won't um and then and then and then and then and then you get all the way to sensate and you get to all of the other stuff that they did and um then you go back to the matrix and it's just it's just the single most beautiful ahead of its time brave story ever told um and that is why the matrix also i will i will confess that i wore black clothes exclusively for 2 years after watching the matrix um i'm not proud of it they didn't look anything like keanu reeves's clothes but um yeah. okay talk, talking of uh, things you're emotional about your favorite uh, tv show of all time lost the ending was dog shit we 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 concede right at the outset that the ending was dog shit but again um with lost what i come back to is the feeling that sort of every episode taking you further down this mystery yes eventually a mystery that was badly answered but it had been so long since tv had had something just so like every episode ended with one like dimag phat gaya like oh ho island pe polar bear aa gaya oh ho island mein hatch hai oh ho island mein ye ho raha hai and somehow to just keep that going for 5 to 6 seasons and get people invested um it was just it for me it's just the pinnacle of what like great storytelling can be in terms of like telling say a campfire story or keeping people interest hooked where every episode and also just it was the first show that sort of landed into the era of the internet message board it was the first show that we all watched sort of collectively and then went back and tore apart at clues and went but you know in this scene i saw this thing on this wall which i think will come into play in the next episode and mean this and just sort of episode by episode crunching theories like this hive mind was it was actually quite a dizzying and thrilling experience when it happened and again it just to me comes down to the community aspect of this pop culture of it which is where it should be able to sort of bring you all together and be like oh my god oh my god let let's all fret about this together it'll be great This was this was the only answer that surprised me, and obviously you will you will elaborate. Your favorite music band of all time is Blink One Eighty Two. My favorite music band of all time is Blink One Eighty Two because uh, again, uh, and and I, and I love a bunch of other bands, obviously. But the, why it is Blink One Eighty Two is this. Again, I was at the, the tender impressionable age of sixteen or seventeen when their album Enema of the State came out. And Enema of the State had two classic songs, I think that everybody knows, which is All the Small Things and What's My Age Again. and because of that i got the cd and i put it on and i started listening and it was the first band i'd heard that whose lyrics were funny it was the first band i'd heard who were the i'd heard songs where the point of the song is to talk about love and i'd heard songs where the point of the song is to talk about like you know a certain event that happened somewhere or whatever but this was the first time I felt like I was hearing a song whose sole purpose it was was to just be sweet and funny. Um and I remember really falling in love with Enema of the State as an album because I kept listening and 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 it 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 doesn't necessarily age very well because it's a very immature album for sure. Like the songs and lyrics are very immature but 16 year old me thought they were hilarious and to just sort of go end to end to in an album and be like okay the dominant emotion I felt while listening to this album was that's hilarious. and i'm like this is new like you know i've i've experienced humor in books and i've experienced humor in movies and i've experienced humor in shows but holy shit this is so different and it's catchy as hell but it's also so different because it's this sort of idea of punk and rock and all of that but then just not at all taking yourself or any of those tropes seriously uh which i think is great and that's why blink 182 one of the greatest moments of my life was seeing them live in concert a couple of years ago It's one of the few concerts I can say I've been to in my life where I was that person who was like screaming and singing every single word of every single song from the start to the finish. Uh then comes the toughest question of the lot where you had to pick an AIB writer and I'm sure there are a bunch of writers uh 
who you could have picked, but you had to pick someone, and you went with Dev. Yeah, yes. who has been on Random Musings earlier. Of course, yeah. yes, of uh, course. Why Dev Arun before, like? Again, they, they. I'll tell you why they. Because Dev is one of those people, like you mentioned, right? There was an office, and there was always something or the other going on in office, whether it was work, whether it was this thing, any of that. But um, Devaya has an intensely dependable presence about him. Like there's something very calm about being, something very calming about being in a meeting with Devaya or being on a project with Devaya. It feels like it doesn't matter. How many? Because and this happens, right? Sometimes you put, like, say, Tanmay in a, and me in a room, or you put Ashish and Tanmay in a room, or you put a bunch of comedy writers in a room, and it's like you've let a bunch of kids loose in the room. Um, is that feeling? Yeah. And in the middle of that, uh, Devaya just has this very reassuring adult in the room. Like, you know what I mean, right? Like with Devaya, she has this very reassuring adult in the room presence. Like his entire vibe is like, like I feel like, like I feel like when Devaya hatches, a fully formed Balki will come out. This is my theory. Um, this is my theory <laughs> with Devaya, <laughs> and um, he's got this very, very comforting like papa presence. Aside from just genuinely being an extremely talented writer and um, idea giver yeah. and sort of strategy executor and all of those things, um, he's just it just I don't think I can't think back of to a single day in a time at AIB where I can say that Devaya has given me stress. That brings us to the last question where you had to pick a book, your favorite book of all time. Yeah. That's just evil. I'll tell you how evil that is. I'll tell you how evil. That's so evil that since you asked that question and now I have forgotten my answer. That's how evil that question is. I'll give you a hint. Uh, Sherlock Holmes. Oh yeah, Haunt of the Baskervilles. <laughs> Correct. Of course. Yes. I'm a sucker for horror. I'm a sucker for being scared. But I feel like one of the things that happens is um, there are great horror books and there are terrible horror books because a great horror book has to do the job of leading your imagination to some very terrifying places. And I remember as a child reading The Hound of Baskervilles. And I remember just more than anything else, I think it's one of the most evocative books ever written. Like there are better Sherlock Holmes mysteries. There are better, there are Sherlock Holmes mysteries that hinge on, turn on better devices. But in terms of just pure atmosphere, and I remember this because again, as uh, somebody who's grown up in Mumbai their whole life, I remember sitting on my sofa at home in the peak of summer when I was reading Hound of Baskervilles for the first time. And then Conan Doyle's depictions and descriptions of the Scottish moors and the highlands and all of that start. And it's just the actual writing on it is so beautiful that even there in that sort of peak of summer in Bombay, you couldn't help but feel like the tendrils of mist from the moor on the back of your neck. You couldn't help but wonder, like even while walking, like in Malabar Hill among all those cars, you couldn't help but wonder if the hound would leap out at you um, out of nowhere and all of those things. And I don't think I've ever read a book spill that even now, just thinking about certain passages and thinking about certain things, I can see the moors, I can see the fog, I can feel it on, on my body. And I feel like that to me is why The Hound of Baskervilles is my favorite book because it was one of the first books that just teleported me uh, to another place. Not necessarily a pleasant place, but just it was so complete in its teleportation to this sort of the Baskerville estate and all of that. Man, thank you, Rohan. All all I can say right now, thank you so much. Thank being, you, uh, KV. What a fun chat. And being part of this. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope you liked it. I hope you had fun. I did. This is a great and, way to end yeah, the day. This is, a, this is a tremendous... In fact, the, the problem is this has actually been such a fun chat that now I know I'm going to be awake for another two hours because like any feelings of sleep that were there before this chat have now vanished. Thanks, Rohan. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening to Random Musings. Uh, we, this is the 10th episode. You can check out all the other nine episodes on here on Random Chikram. You can also hear us on uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts and everything. Yeah, that's it. Please review them also. Apparently that helps with the algorithm like on the podcast. Oh, really? Okay. Review them. Very awkward. Review them. Review them.